welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about nucleic acids. So it's also one of the four macromolecules. So our macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats. We are going to look at the structure and the function of the two nucleic acids. The two nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. We're going to look at how those are made, what kind of molecules compose DNA and RNA, and what are their main functions? Where do we find them and what do they do and why do they matter? If we look at the cell, inside the nucleus, we have our chromosomes. Every single cell that has a nucleus in humans contains all 46 chromosomes. We get 23 chromosomes from our mom and we get 23 chromosomes from our dad. Each chromosome is one DNA molecule. So DNA is the largest of the macromolecules. One DNA molecule can be a couple of centimeters long. And the DNA has to be condensed inside the cell so that it fits. A nucleus diameter can be anywhere from five to 10 micrometers. So that's very small. So we condense our DNA with these proteins called histones. Histone proteins help the DNA to coil and fold into a chromosome. When we look at the chromosomes between males and females, two of the chromosomes are sex chromosomes. In females, there are two X chromosomes, and in males, there is an X and a Y. So this is the difference between males and females. If we look at the DNA structure inside our cell, we have this coiled up chromosome put together by histones. If we uncoil that DNA, and now we look over here at one DNA structure, one DNA molecule, it has a very specific structure called a double helix. It is a double stranded molecule. There are two strands of DNA that combine in the center. So what are these molecules that are making up the DNA? So we're gonna look at the monomer or the building block of the DNA and how it gets put together. RNA is very similar, so we're gonna look at DNA first and then we will look at RNA. Okay, so over here we have the monomer or the building block for all DNA and RNA molecules, and they are called nucleotides. Every nucleotide has these three structures. There is a phosphate group, which is a phosphorus and oxygens, and they have a negative charge. Over here, we have our nitrogenous base. So the bases contain nitrogen. We're gonna look at the different types. This one is showing thymine, but we're gonna look at, there's five different kinds of nucleotides, and it's different, each one is different because of the base. And then over here we have the sugar. The sugar in DNA is called deoxyribose. In RNA, it's called ribose. And there's only one tiny difference. In RNA, ribose, there will be an oxygen here. So in DNA, it's deoxyribose because this oxygen is not there. So those are the main differences between the RNA nucleotide and the DNA nucleotide. It's about the sugar. Deoxyribose versus ribose. Where do we get these? So our cells can make nucleotides and we can eat them. When we digest anything that is a plant or an animal that is composed of cells, we are going to be eating nucleic acids and we have enzymes in our digestive tract that specifically digest and break down nucleic acids that we would get out of plants and animals. So if you're eating a whole food diet, you're getting lots of nucleotides, and if you aren't, then your cells can still make them. So we, we don't usually have to worry about a nucleotide deficiency. This slide is showing the five different nucleotides. So there's a few things that are important here. So when we look at the DNA nucleotides, DNA will be composed of cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. 
When we look at these nucleotides, you can see that two of them are a single ringed structure. They are called pyrimidines. The single ringed nucleotides are cytosine and thymine. Two of the nucleotides are double ringed structures and they are called purines. The purines are guanine and adenine. Now, I'll talk about uracil in a second. Over here, with our DNA nucleotides, they combine with each other. We're gonna look at the structure in a second, but there's two strands of DNA. Remember, DNA is a double helix. So when DNA combines, their nucleotides will match up with each other. And adenine, always matches up with thymine. So there's a purine matching up with a pyrimidine and cytosine always matches up with guanine. So again, a purine with a pyrimidine. This keeps the structure of the DNA helix symmetrical. Over here, we have uracil. Uracil is also a pyrimidine. We only find uracil in RNA. In RNA, we do not have thymine. So in RNA, the C's and the G's will, will use the DNA molecule to produce the RNA. Um, so a C from a DNA molecule would match up with an RNA, a guanine, and an adenine would match up with a uracil. So uracil basically replaces thymine in RNA molecules. When we look at the DNA structure, there's a few things that are important. So there's two strands of DNA and they match up to form this, the double ring sort of twisted ladder structure, the alpha helical kind of structure. So those bases will match up with each other on each side of the DNA. And there's different bonds that hold the DNA together. So on this slide, we can see how the double strand of DNA, if it is opened up and sort of flattened out, how the nucleotides bind to each other. So here we have one strand of DNA and the other strand of DNA, and they're connected by nucleotides. So here we have a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. One nucleotide, which is guanine, which is a purine, and it always combines with cytosine. So here's a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. And they are held together by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, if you recall, are connected to each other by polar attractive forces. So these bonds can be broken, which in another video we'll talk about how DNA replicates. These are held together by hydrogen bonds. There are always three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. Down here, we have a phosphate, a sugar, and a base, which is adenine, which always combines with thymine. Adenine and thymine always form two hydrogen bonds. So this is how the nucleotides stick together between the strands of DNA. Over here, you can see that we have a phosphate binding to a sugar, to a phosphate, to a sugar. This is the sugar phosphate backbone. There's a sugar phosphate backbone on each side. You can see how the sugars are numbered. Before we talked about how, if this is a DNA molecule, the second carbon of the sugar will have a hydrogen. If it was an RNA molecule, it would have an OH group instead of just an H. The number one carbon of the sugar is what binds to the base, and the number five carbon binds to a phosphate, and the number three carbon will bind to the next phosphate. So DNA has a direction. We have a three prime end and a five prime end. The opposite strand, moves in the opposite direction.
The last thing that I want to talk about is the other bonds. So hydrogen bonds are holding the bases together. And then we have phosphodiester bonds. So phosphodiester bonds hold the sugar and the phosphates together. And over here, the bond holding the sugar to the base is a glycosidic bond. These are both covalent bonds. They're very, very strong bonds. These bonds never break. So if you're gonna eat DNA because you just ate a salad and the plant cells have protein and DNA, the nucleotides will stay together. We have enzymes that will kind of chop up some of these bonds, but the hydrogen bonds will break much easier than the covalent bonds. So those are the bonds that hold our DNA molecules together. So we know that every time there is an adenine on one side of the DNA, it will be combining with a thymine. Every time there is a guanine on one side, there will be a cytosine on the other. So that means you can predict the opposite strand of a DNA molecule. So we're gonna give that a try. We're gonna go to this example. Here we have a DNA sequence. Let's give it direction. So let's say this is the three prime end and this is the five prime end. What is the complementary strand? So the complementary strand is going to be opposite direction and you can figure out what the other strand of DNA is. Every time there is an adenine, there is going to be a thymine. Whenever there's a cytosine, there will be a guanine. So you can always figure out the opposite sequence of DNA. The other thing that we can do, let's suppose this is a gene. Let's suppose this top strand is a gene sequence for, say, insulin protein. And then we're gonna make an RNA molecule. Remember there was a difference between DNA and RNA. So when we're gonna make an RNA molecule, we have to change the thymines into uracils. So we're going to look just briefly at how we can produce an RNA molecule from a DNA molecule. In the cell, a DNA molecule, remember DNA is found in the nucleus. This is, suppose this is a gene sequence. One of the strands of DNA will be the gene and the other strand is just the complementary strand. So we can label these based on what strand is going to be used to make the RNA. Let's suppose we're going to make insulin. So if this top strand is the template, then we're going to have an enzyme called RNA polymerase that will make RNA. It's going to make RNA by reading the template strand and putting the opposite nucleotides in the correct order. So if this was C, G, A, A, T, the RNA strand is going to be G, C, U, U, whoops, A. So the opposite nucleotides always go together, A's and T's or A's and U's when it's RNA. So this is how we use a gene sequence to make an RNA sequence. The opposite strand is called the coding strand. Sometimes it's called the sense strand. And the template strand is sometimes called the antisense strand. Okay, so those names go together. So DNA is used to make RNA. That RNA will then be used to make a protein. So if we are going to make an insulin protein, we need an insulin gene, then we make insulin RNA, then that will code for the amino acids that make that protein. We've compared DNA and RNA. So DNA has slightly different structure and function slightly different sugar, slightly different nucleotides. So if we look at this final chart, it'll show a comparison of both of these nucleic acids.